Good morning again, friends. So last week, actually I took a week's break, so this was the week before that. We looked at the three gunas, we looked at the 14th chapter. These uh, last chapters of Gita, we are almost at the very end of the scripture uh, in these weeks. Uh, are rather short and they have very specific topics that they cover and discuss. So I'm going to move on this week to the 15th chapter. And the 15th chapter is actually very well known for the very first verse of this chapter, which is what I'm going to start with today. And I'm going to read this verse in Sanskrit for you, as I always do. Urdhva mula madaha shaka mashvattam prahuravyayam chandamsi yasya parnani Yastam Vedasa Vedavit. And I'm going to now read Swami Kriyananda's translation of the verse. This is Krishna speaking to Arjuna. The wise speak of the imperishable Ashwatta tree with its roots above and its branches below. Its leaves are the Vedic hymns. Whosoever understands this tree of life knows the Vedas. So, so it's pretty clear the topic that we're discussing today is this tree of life. I did not quite realize uh, until very recently that this is a concept that is so commonly used and discussed in many, many different cultures, uh, both in Judaism and Christianity and of course in Hinduism. And there's a lot that could be said and the Gita itself presents a lot of metaphors, not just in this verse, in the next few verses as well. I'll see how much I can actually cover today. I don't quite know where I'm going to go with this. But I want to start with some uh, an equivalent passage from the Bible. Not a passage I've not read or studied the Bible in that sense. But the very first time I read the autobiography of a yogi, uh, which I hope you all have read, uh, and perhaps this part in the book spoke to you as well. Uh, I was quite fascinated by a lot of explanations that Yogananda gives for many biblical verses. Of course, I had no familiarity with Christian traditions or Bible at that time. I'm talking about 12, 14 years ago. I was right out of college and I was so fascinated when I first read that book. And I clearly remember Yogananda's explanation of the genesis of Adam and Eve and the apple and all of that. Although I had very less familiarity with the New Testament or almost none with the Old Testament, I had read uh, Milton's Paradise Lost. So <laughs> I do remember that story of Adam and Eve and I really loved that poem and the way he described it. But I had no idea just by reading or hearing the story of Adam and Eve what deep symbolism it represented for us. So I want, I want to start there. I want to talk a little bit about the story of Genesis itself and how it relates to this Gita verse that we are discussing today and what this symbolism presents for all of us. And then we'll see where we go from there. I actually, yesterday, as I was preparing for this, I found Yoganandaji's original writings on the Genesis. So I'll probably quote a few lines from there as we discuss. Let me start by reading some of his words. In essence, what we are talking about here, even before I jump in too far into it, the Gita describes a tree as its roots up and branches below. What it is talking about is in this human person, as we reflect and manifest this consciousness on this plane, our source of energy does not come from the material plane. That is why the Ashwatha tree has its roots above. Interestingly, somebody recently I was chatting with, he was telling me about some tradition in India where um, it is actually believed that this particular tree, the people tree, which is what is referred to in the Gita, that's what we call them these days, uh, it is believed that the branches of the tree are the roots. I thought to myself, I mean, you can clearly see it. The branches are just the branches. It's not that literally there are roots above in the air and uh, branches and leaves under the soil. It's pretty clear when you look at a tree, that's not what it is. But obviously this idea is very symbolic. What Krishna is describing is the source of energy, the sap of life force that is coming into us, into this form, as I was just sharing in that chant written by Swami, is coming from above. It's coming from the divine. It's coming from the thousand petal lotus, the Sahasrara that is situated here. That is the pure expression of divinity. And then it descends in, into that sixth chakra, through the medulla and the positive pole of that chakra is obviously the spiritual eye. We have discussed these concepts in previous episodes before. 
So this energy, this life force is coming into this tree of life from above and the branches, the ways in which it manifests, it expresses and it relates to the world are below. So there is a downward motion of energy, just quite the opposite of what it is in a tree because in a tree, the, the nutrients and water go from the roots, from the soil up into the tree. I remember uh, some years ago, I was traveling somewhere in California and I was in a national park. And uh, national parks have these rangers and led tours where people describe a lot of different things. And I'm just completely fascinated. If I was not busy doing this, I always imagined that I would want to be a national park ranger. I just love spending time in nature and exploring in that way. And I remember I was walking through a very dense redwood forest. And this ranger looked at our group, it was just a very small group, and he was giving us a tour of this beautiful redwood forest. And he was saying, do you realize what you're standing next to is a waterfall? It's a waterfall that is transporting uh, 50, 60 gallons of water every minute. And I was looking at this tree that was thousands of years old, at least hundreds of years old. And he was describing how inside the trunk of the tree, there is 50 or 60 gallons of water that is moved up and down, not down, up every minute. So you can think of it, the tree is a downward waterfall because the water is not flowing from top to bottom, but rather it is going from the base up into the branches. And he was describing how it is so healing to be uh, with these big trees because you can feel the cooling effect of this water and this flow of energy that is happening inside their spine. And what Krishna is describing here, quite appropriately, the metaphor for us, for life itself in conscious beings like us as animals and humans, is again uh, a waterfall, but that is coming from top. Because a tree, in that sense, uh, speaking very materially, it is drawing its nutrients down from the soil, but we are drawing those nutrients, that prana that is coming into our body from above, from the divine, from the seventh chakra, through the medulla, it is flowing into our body. Now, as I started to say, I want to move on to the Genesis. Now, the reason why the symbolism is so important and so appropriate, because when we think of life itself, all this prana coming to us, it is coming through these higher chakras and flowing inside our spine and it is dissipated through the branches, through the periphery. And there is another metaphor that Krishna presents here with the leaves, I'll come to that just in a bit. Now I want to read Yoganandaji describing the Garden of Eden. A human being is an upturned tree. The hair and cervical nerves are the roots. The spinal cord is the trunk and the efferent nerves ramifying from them are the branches. The fruits are the senses. So this is how he describes the tree of life and how it relates to the human body. And the women said unto the serpent, now he's quoting the Bible, we may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, and neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So this is quoting from Genesis, from the Bible. Now, why is that so? Now, if this Garden of Eden is created as an expression of the human person, uh, if this energy was meant to flow into this tree of life and express itself through these leaves and flowers and fruits, why is it that we are forbidden from eating that fruit? It is not that we cannot enjoy the Garden of Eden. These senses and this body are vehicles that are given to us for experience, for the experience of life itself, through the sense faculties. But there is just one fruit, as the Genesis describes, that we are forbidden from eating. And I will again continue to read Yoganandaji's writings on this because he says this so perfectly. The human body is a garden of Eden where there are several trees or nervous systems bearing different kinds of fruits of the senses. That is, optical, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, and tactical, tactual. I don't know if that's the right word, nerve centers bearing the sense fruits of the attractive sensations of sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. God wishes man to enjoy all the fruits of the senses, senses which grow in this garden of the nervous system except the fruit of the nerve tree of the creative force 
situated in the middle of the bodily garden. So Yogananda Ji is specifically uh, talking about the sexual faculty here. He's talking about how this entire nervous system, this flow of prana, this tree itself, were created for man's enjoyment except for that one fruit. And why is that so? Uh, of course, he writes in much more detail, both in this article and in various other places, this creative force when that kundalini is engaged in that downward direction, what it reaffirms is our animal nature. It does not raise us up to the divine. Whereas as the Genesis describe, the first man was made in the image of God. This tree is an image of God. And what makes it not an image of God, what makes it tainted by this material plane is that energy flows downward and it's set in those ways. The serpent convinces the Eve, the serpent obviously, if the symbolism is not, uh, it, it, it cannot be any more clear. The serpent is representing the kundalini energy, but it's not representing the awakened kundalini energy that is actually raising us towards our spiritual aspiration, but rather the wound up kundalini energy. The magnetism of the wound up kundalini serpent that is at the base of the spine, and that is convincing us to draw that energy to the lower centers, to dissipate that energy through that sexual act. And what that does is it cements, it affirms that commitment for the kundalini to stay wound up in that same way. In essence, it keeps us from our own divine potential. It is not to say that, uh, you know, somehow sex is unholy. That's not the point of Genesis. Even when we talk about, uh, you know, the apple, the forbidden fruit representing the sexual act, it is not to taint the act of sex itself or, you know, uh, to present connotations of sin or anything else, but to understand that this downward flow of energy, when it is drawn out in that way, it reaffirms our own commitment to our animal nature, whereas the whole objective of this tree of life is to draw that energy back to its source, because that helps us realize our divine potential and everything else in the Garden of Eden becomes so much more joyful because all these other pleasures of the senses, pleasure almost seems like the wrong word to use, but it is true. Everything else, the beauties of this world are for man to enjoy. And there's so much joy and pleasure that can come out of this tree of life if only we don't taint it by its association with that lower flow of the kundalini energy. So the tree of life in Genesis, what Krishna is describing here, they represent the same principle. And it's so important for us to understand the other uh, idea that is common, confused and uh, misinterpreted is about Adam and Eve, how the women is the culprit. And now, uh, somehow, scriptures are written in such uh, heavily patriarchal times that women are vilified and now the man is a victim to all of this. It's not man and women. Again, Yogananda Ji describes in detail what he's talking about is a rational sense. You know, you read these scriptures, we have been reading 14 chapters of Krishna describing to us these philosophies that almost seem self-evident. You know, uh, detach from the fruits of your action. You're going to suffer, you know, you know, what are the gunas? What are the different forms of yoga? How can you practice these? How can you be free? How can you be happy? And all of this makes so much sense. The rational mind is not hard to convince on these theories and principles. And why is it then that it is so hard for us to live those teachings? Why can we not always remain in that divine flow uh, with these philosophies that almost seem self-evident? It is because that feeling nature in us, which is feminine in its essence, that's why the symbols are presented as Adam and Eve. As much as the rational mind understands that this fruit that I'm touching right now is eventually going to lead to my own suffering, it is pretty self-evident to the rational mind, but the feeling is tempted by that downward flow of energy. Desire itself is a feeling. It is not a thought. It is not it is not a rational idea. It can never be rationalized. In the autobiography, another thing that Yogananda Ji states so categorically and presents as a foundation for yogic understanding is this idea that rational mind always follows feeling, how the mind always follows the heart. 
So that's really what is represented in the story of the serpent tempting the Eve and then Eve convincing Adam. It's because that downward flow of Kundalini energy is convincing our own feeling. It is involving our heart by engaging our likes and dislikes and that eventually will convince the rational mind because the rational mind is still part of that ego which does not have independence until we are established in God to be able to see truth in its perfection. So we are constantly under the influence of that serpent and the only way we can raise that energy as we have been seeing in the 12th chapter and a few other ways is to purify Eve is to purify that feeling nature that is in us through devotion, through self-offering, to again dissociate that downward flow of energy from that feeling nature so the feeling can be consciously pointed in the upward direction. Now, there's a lot more that Krishna says here in this verse. I don't want to um, leave all that unsaid. Let's see. Um, one thing that he talks about here is the why speak of the imperishable Ashwatha tree and this in itself is an important point to note because if we are talking of tree as the human body of course it's rather ironic to call it imperishable because Krishna has been talking about in all these chapter just about the nature of human life and body itself how all of this is just a form that is eventually going to wilt then why is it why is he calling it the imperishable Ashwatha tree what he is referring to as the Ashwatha tree is not just the physical body but the divine seed that is manifesting itself through the causal body and the astral body so even when the physical body perishes, that's why he's especially using that word imperishable. In Sanskrit, he says avyayam, which means to say it does not have uh, any end. It does not have any way in which it dissipates or diminishes. What that means is that divine seed is manifesting itself. And even when the body perishes, this flow of life force, this flow of energy just condenses into, its, uh, its, into that seed within, into that energy body. And even when the energy body body perishes, that same uh, life intelligence is condensed in the causal body. So until we liberate ourselves of all these encasings, even in which case the divine seed still exists in unity with God, but until that point, the tree is imperishable. The tree always exists. And what it is also representing is just as a tree, you know, when the tree is there, even if the tree dies, just speaking of redwood forest, you will see when you walk in a redwood forest, there are other sprigs that are going from the, growing from the root of the tree, and then they become big trees. In that same way, these astral tendencies that are within us, just as one body perishes, even if it is simply contained in that seed, it will eventually manifest itself as another physical Ashwatha tree that has to again experience these same sensory experiences, draw energy from the higher sources and express it in this world. In that way, this is an ongoing cycle of reincarnation that Krishna is referring to here when he says the imperishable Ashwatha tree because what is driving that tree are not the details of this plane but that divine seed within. And another interesting analogy that he makes here, give me a second here, I lost my page is the leaves of the tree are the Vedic hymns. Now, I've read this before and it never made sense to me and until I read Swami Kriyananda's commentary on it, he talks about when Krishna is talking about the Vedic hymns, what do, we, what do we mean by that? We have been talking about the tree and its branches as sensory experiences and ways in which we express in the world. Swami Kriyananda explains how the idea of the Vedas themselves, what they refer to in their essence is that supreme knowledge that is gained through experience, that is gained by interaction with the world through the senses. So when Krishna refers to the leaves as Vedic hymns, he's talking about the essence of that knowledge that one can gain by interacting with the world through the sensory experiences themselves. As Swami writes here, the way they came spoken about here are the vibrations of sensory knowledge transmitted to the brain from the senses by the way of the nervous system. And that's why Krishna goes on to say, one who understands this knows life itself and knows the Vedas. So when we are able 
to use experiences of this body, of the senses, of this world in order to direct that energy back in and use that as a way to learn, use that as a way to understand and realize what life is and who God is, then we know Vedas themselves. So in that sense, all the experiences in their highest form that we have in this world are the learning of the Vedas because they are in essence meant to give us that knowledge. Now, I want to talk about, I think I have about five minutes, I just want to cover one other idea. I want to read the next couple of verses because this imagery of, imagery of tree is used by Krishna to explain so many other subtle philosophical concepts. This is the second verse of the 15th chapter. Its branches extend below and above, nurtured by the gunas. Its buds are sense objects. Small roots extend also downward into the world of man, impelling man into action. Now, I have read these verses before, I have to say, and it, it was all fascinating to think about, and I've seen paintings of the tree of life and all of that, but I cannot actually say it made sense to me until I was reading Yoganandaji's commentary on these verses. Here, Krishna is talking about branches extending both below and above. And this is where if you're actually picturing a tree in your head, um, it's a, it becomes a little hard. It becomes clear that it is symbolic. So what Krishna is talking about here is, first he says the roots are above and the branches are below. And then now he starts to say that the branches are both below and above, and the roots are also both above and below. So what are we talking about here? What is this magical tree? What does it even look like? You have roots both above and below and also branches above and below. They extend in both directions. What Krishna is referring to is another subtle and an important point for us to understand. When he talks about branches above and below, what we are referring to is the sensory experiences of the world can either draw us downward or back toward our own source. They can be used in either way. And all of us, as we experience life, we have both kinds of branches that, exp that are expressing through our physical body, through this tree of life, which is some branches are taking us into that world. They are, they are pure sensory experiences that are taking us deeper and deeper into delusion and into maya. Whereas there are also the other branches, which are sensory experiences, which take us back toward our source, whether it's uplifting time in nature, whether it's beautiful spiritual music that reminds us of our own uh, inner nature, whatever it is, there are still experiences of this world, branches that lead toward the source. And what about the roots that Krishna is talking about? The roots are up and he says there are also roots coming from the branches back towards its source. That is to say, and let me read exactly what the Gita verse says here. Small roots extend also downward into the world of men, impelling man into action. Now roots, as we already discussed, they represent that source of energy from where we draw the life force. And here Krishna is saying there are small roots that also come from the world, not just from above. What he's talking about is we also draw energy from the sensory experiences themselves. The passion of the world itself is also an instigator of that life force. What drives us in this world, even if it is mere pursuit of sensory pleasure, that gives us energy to be able to pursue it. And Krishna says, when we start drawing energy that way, it impels man back to action again. So drawing energy from the smaller roots, how oftentimes, I was recently watching a documentary uh, that was talking about how uh, of successful people in this world, how they are motivated, how they set this goal to reach this by this year and to do that, to make this much money or to achieve this particular thing with their company or whatever it is. I not think of, I'm not exactly thinking of specific examples right now, but we can all think of all those things we have seen that worldly success, the allure of worldly success itself is also a source of energy. That's what Krishna refers to by smaller roots. And if we are not perceptive enough, if we are not aware enough, it can feel like that is a persistent source of energy. That's what drives 90, 99% of this world, where people feel that that is so satisfying that they pursue it with all their heart and mind and strength. 
And what Krishna is saying is, as much as it might seem that these roots are feeding you, these smaller roots do bring life force back to you and they draw more life force into this tree of life, but they will impel you back to action. All that they do is propagate more and more the cycle of birth and rebirth and death. They do not take you back to the source. So friends, with that, I think I'm out of time for today morning. This is such an interesting imagery that is simply worth meditating on. I hope you found inspiration and perhaps you have more ideas and thoughts that come to you on this tree of life. I'll see you next week with another verse from the Gita. Until then, God bless you.